The title of the message this morning is When the Going Gets Tough. So if I say that out loud to you, I could expect a certain phrase back in return, right? If I say, when the going gets tough. Well, in this day and age, the tough get going is kind of lost. It's, it, it, you know, it's more like the tough eat ice cream, right? Or, or chocolate, right? The tough are going to eat, or dark chocolate, right? Grown only in one country, like certain beans of a certain, right? I mean, or the tough go and binge on Netflix or, uh, you know, Minecraft or the Hallmark Channel or something, right? You know, uh, you know that's we go when the tough gets going. That's where we go these days, right? Or, or uh, you call Uber Eats. You say, "I'm done with this. No way, Uber Eats. I don't care what it costs, right? The delivery cost is twice as much as the food. I don't care. It got tough, and I needed something other than what I was trying to do to get there." Well, as much as that's funny, there's been a lot of tough going lately. I mean, really lately, like the last hundred years, it feels like, right? There's been tough going in this world. There's a lot of circumstances that, and we have the news of every place, every day, every minute right now, always available to us. You just pull that phone out and you can know everything that happened everywhere. And that starts to weigh us down a little bit. We have a burden for that, for people not to be in difficulties, but we also start to worry about our own circumstances. And then I started, I've really been thinking a lot about this church and our church and, and how much the last few weeks, it seems like the car accidents, loved ones in distress, whether even people passing away, terrible, sickness, difficult times, financially, there's been a lot, not just the last few weeks, but on and on. It makes me think a couple of things. One is there's tough going. And that's part of what drove me into, into exploring this. But the second thing is the fact that we all know so much about each other is a good thing. And you'll hear a little bit more about that as we get going. Perhaps you've been in circumstances, maybe even in a church, where you were surprised when you heard about that thing that had been going on for so long. Not that we should be involved in the gossip of it but to be involved in the knowledge of it, meaning we can pray for each other and we can minister to each other, we can support each other, right? And so that's what this church feels like to me. So there's been some tough times going on lately. And I know, I know from talking with a lot of you and praying with a lot of you, and you praying for me and our family as well, the things that are going on that we're concerned about each other and, we're, and we, even ourselves, we're facing difficult things. But this morning, I wanna help us take a look in the Bible at how Jesus dealt with tough times. This whole year, we've dedicated to becoming better disciples, and most recently, how do we be the church? And, and today, I want to try to uh, pinpoint a couple of things that are about both of those, uh, those subjects. Um, one last comment uh, before I begin and dig into the, into the, uh, into the word. Um, Jesus, I don't think, ever called us to be tough. I, I think I could preach a sermon on perseverance, but I don't think he called us to be tough. In fact, if you look at Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes, the words he used for the people that were listening to him were poor in spirit, mourners, the meek, the hung, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful and pure in heart and peacemakers and the persecuted. He called those the blessed. He's, and he was speaking to those following him. And he said, blessed are you. You are blessed when you have that experience. You are blessed. So that's the first phrase that he used to describe those that were his followers. They were the blessed. The second thing that he called his closest followers were friends. There came a point in time in their walk with Jesus where they came to understand God's purposes. He said, because you know my father's business. That's the way he said it. You know my father's business. And we obey his commands. I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I'm going to call you my friend. And so this morning, we're not going to be known as the tough. We're going to be known as the blessed friends of Jesus. Does that sound pretty good? It sounds good. You know, and Jesus also taught us that worry has to do with the future and that we ought not to be so concerned with worrying about that. Right? Don't worry about tomorrow, he said in Matthew. For tomorrow will worry for, has enough worries about itself. Each day has enough troubles. Don't get caught up in tomorrow's troubles. They're going to hit you over the head soon enough. 
That's the Pete Amplified version, right? <laughs> That's only speaking from experience. Now, I also want to say, please don't take any of my comments today as any kind of criticisms. If you've tried to tough it out and you've been doing your very best and you've been hanging on the best you can, it's not wrong. We're just trying to learn and get better. It's not wrong what we've been doing. We're trying to grow in our maturity and be a better church. So we also know you can tell what, what's inside of a person when they get squeezed. Tough times are squeezing times, and we can tell what comes out of us is what we're really made of when the pressure mounts and when we get caught off guard. So Jesus gave us a look at what it looked like for him. I don't think he was caught off guard, but he faced this very difficult moment. So let's take a look at scriptures. If you open your Bibles, Matthew 26, verses 36 to 45. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. One footnote for you. Gethsemane was near the Mount of Olives. And Gethsemane means to press, to squeeze. It was the place where they pressed and squeezed the olives to get the olive oil out of it. And Jesus went to a place of, to pray in a garden where he was going to be squeezed. That's about what's going to happen right now. He's going to be under the pressure of what he's about to face. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and he went away once more and he prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Let's pray. God, you're gracious to us, and we thank you for loving us first. We thank you for sending your Son to redeem us. We thank you for your word that instructs and guides us. We pray today your Holy Spirit will plant seeds of truth from your word deep into our hearts and those seeds will grow and will bear fruit that reflects the character and the nature of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so when the going gets tough, the blessed friends of Jesus, first of all, they get their friends around them. They get their friends. Jesus didn't go into this most difficult situation all alone. He had done that many, many times, gone off to pray alone. That was this common pattern. You go over there. You get on the boat and sail across. I'm going up in the hills and I'll pray. He did it over and over again. But in this case, he took his closest friends with him. He knew he was going to be up against very difficult, challenging times. He knew it was not right to go at it alone. He took the three people on earth who were the very closest to him. The very three people people that were the very closest to him and he asked them to support him in his own prayers you see when the going gets tough it's really important that we get some help there's something powerful in that partnering together it's why we ask are there needs and then we stand together right here in this place we stop everything we're doing we're worshiping God we stop and we do that it's as important a part of the service as everything else that we do here is the time we spend in prayer together. It's why for the Kenya team, we said, can I recruit a prayer partner for each and every one of those people so that we know we have covering for every person on the mission team? And then all the rest of you said, we want to join in too. And so we're all praying for them constantly. I'm not surprised that they're in generally very good health, that they're seeing success over them. I'm not surprised, church, because we're praying. We're with them. So don't stop this week. Don't stop. Because they're due to face difficulty, right? They're going to get tired. The food's not always going to agree with them. 
right? If you've ever been anywhere else, you know what I'm talking about. And you're far from home and nothing feels worse than being sick far from home. Where's my pillow, right? I know. So, but we're partners. Let's look at a great example of a, of a strategic partnership as we find it in the Bible. This is in Exodus 17, verses 8 through 13. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with my staff, with the staff of God in my hands. And so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur were on top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other. And so his hands remained steady until sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. In this short passage, we see the importance of partnering. Joshua was a mighty warrior and could have gone out there alone and, in fact, fought many battles alone. And Moses stood with his hands up and great things happened in the past. But in this case, God directed them and said, all four of you have a strategic important role. All of you take your proper place. Each of you do what it is is necessary for this victory to happen. And so all of us do different things. But when we do them in concert together, then the favor of God and the victory of God happens. Some of us go out and face the enemy and commit to fight. Some of us are warriors in that way. There are people in this church who are spiritual warriors who will fight, who want to know what's going on in this community, what's going on in this church. No, devil, you have no place there. But they can't go it alone. Some of them are willing to go out and risk like Joshua. Others need to be ready to stand with us in battle and bring the presence of God to the battle, but not be the person who's directly at war. See, if they all four had gone down there, there could have been confusion. Who was leading the army? Joshua was leading the army, but the presence of God was there because Moses had his hands up. They all did their part. Some others hold us up when we're weak, physically and spiritually, emotionally, some of, some of us hold each other up. We need that. We need to be supported. And when we all do our parts, we're all victorious. Many years ago, um, in, my, in some of the training that I took uh, early on in my career, management training, we were taught this phrase, this series of phrases, the five most important words, you did a good job. The four most important words, what is your opinion? The three most important words, let's work together. The two most important words, thank you. And the most important word is we. And that's where I want to get to this today. It's we. We're in this together. It's not, I'll pray for you, good luck, see you later. So I need to continue that. I need to be still hooked to that. Look over at Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. Romans 12, 4 through 8. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is to giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What a wonderful list of the blessed friends of Jesus and the superpowers that we all have, right? In our culture in this day, we're caught up in the superpowers that we see on the screen. This is God's set of superpowers, and we've each got one. And if we exercise those faithfully, then God's kingdom is what grows. See, when the going gets tough, it's time to get with your trustworthy partners, your closest friends. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken.
Let's look over at Ephesians 6 for a second, verses 10 through 17. Remember, I asked the Holy Spirit to plant seeds from his word, from God's word. So I'm giving you a lot of word today. I'm hoping these seeds are getting planted in your heart. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you believe that? It's true, right? Therefore, because that's true, therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Get ready and stay ready. Take it up. It doesn't ever say put it back down. So there's a couple of pictures that form in my mind when I start thinking about this armor of God thing and the war that we're supposed to be in. I don't hear Jesus say it's over with, take, take the stuff off. What I do picture is, after being in that battle for a while, I'm a little roughed up. And if I can in, in, greet you and, and I meet Jim and coming down the other way and he says, brother, you look like you're in pretty bad shape there. Let me refit that for you. Let me fix your armor for you. Let me take and bound, pound some dents out of that shield. Let me, let me help you get ready again. That's what we do for each other. We can see in each other where maybe the armor is not quite so ready anymore and we can help each other. The other picture is this. When you're in war, almost all of this armor covers the front. The shield, the swords for going forward, the breastplate, almost all of this is for the front. Well, the enemy's not so, he's pretty sly. He's prowling around. And so we need someone to cover our back. And so sometimes in a battle, Mike and I are going to stand back to back. And I'm going to trust he's got me and I got him. And as long as I can feel that strength of his muscles behind me and him and me, we're, we're going to be together. We're going to be strong. This is the phrase, I got your back. Have you ever wondered? This is where it comes from, this concept of being in war and saying, who's, where I can't see and defend myself, who's going to? I got your back. We got to be that kind of friend. I got your back. It's more than a casual. It's more than that. I put a place on your, on your notes there. There's not a slide for it because you have the answers, not me. There's a list that says one, two, three or stars with three lines. I want you to write in there the three names of the people that got your back or you wish they had your back because maybe you want them to have your back, but they don't know that you want them to have your back. Write it down now. Take a piece of paper. And if you don't have a bulletin, then take another piece of paper and write down the names. Three people who, if you had to go to the hardest of hard things, who would you call? Who would you want with you? What three people on this earth do you want to be able to say, at any time, night, or day, I'm calling them because I need help now? And then don't lose that. They got your back. If they don't know you got your back, they need to find that out. <laughs> You're counting on them. All right? So, blessed friends of Jesus, when the going gets tough, the second thing that we are to do that Jesus taught us is to get honest. Get honest. In verse 38 of, of Matthew 26 in our scriptures today, Jesus said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This was not a... Uh, uh, a moment in time when someone came up and said, Jesus, how's it going? Fine. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I am overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know, Jesus is probably the one person that we might anticipate would never give an answer like that. If it was any of us, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm the son of God. It's all cool. I got it under control. Right? We would have kept up in a front. We would, we would have said, no, we, no, we're, and who are you, by the way? You know, you're just, you know, little John, little Peter, right? You know, 
He didn't do that. He had every right to, but he didn't do that. He didn't lie or hide. He didn't cover up. He didn't try to play it off. He was very blunt and honest about what he was going through. I am so overwhelmed with sorrow. I feel like I could die. There's a song in there someplace, right? I'm so lonesome. I could, yeah, right? Well, <laughs> right? That, that, that was my theme song before I got Jesus. I'm so lonesome I could die. It's gotten a lot easier in our lives to just kind of cover it up, right? Especially, and I don't, I'm not going to pick on social media the rest of the service, but social media makes it super easy to cover. Right? You just don't see on Facebook, a lot, I mean, a few people that I know do, but hardly anybody's putting out there, I'm so sad I could die. It's like, man, we had the best day at the beach. You wouldn't believe it. You know, the sun is always shining in my neighborhood. Right? And, you know, whatever my wife cooks, it's always gourmet to the top. Right? And so, you know, I mean, that's what social media, but, and we don't talk to each other as much. Words don't come out of our lips. They come off of our thumbs. And so we're not connected to each other to where we can even see or experience what's really going on. I walked up to somebody in our church this morning, and before I could get 10 feet away, I saw there was something wrong. Because physically, I could see that person was in pain. But if it's all on the screen, it's easy to bluff that, right? 20 years ago, an entire generation ago, 20 years ago, there was a book published that is called The Day America Told the Truth. And they went all over the country and they interviewed thousands of people. And what they found out was that 91% of the people that they interviewed admitted to lying on a regular basis. 91%. Now, I don't know whether to believe them because they were admitted liars or those who didn't admit it because they could be lying about that. I don't know, right? But 91% of the people said, yeah, oh yeah, we lie. What's, and, but the point of it was almost like, well, what's the big deal with that? 81% of those people admitted to their lying about their feelings. Like that's a really common thing that we lie about, our condition and our emotions. That was 20 years ago. I, I got a feeling that, I got to wonder, maybe it's even worse. I know that in a lot of our, um, in, the, in the current young adult literature and the, and the kind of books that are really popular and some of the movies that are coming, being deceitful is becoming more of a virtue. Being sneaky and getting it, you know, it's becoming like, oh, we should admire and follow. And it's justifiable to be deceitful. Remember one of the, one of the titles for those who are blessed is those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What if we hungered and thirsted for righteousness in every moment of our day? And we said, Lord, I want to be righteous. And so then let me also see not only in myself, but in others and how I can help them also. Let's be honest about our unrighteousness so that we might be found righteous. The most common lie that we both hear and tell on an almost daily basis is contained in one word. The most common lie. We all do it. When someone says, how are you? And you say, it's the most common lie. We all tell it. You're calculating in an instant. You're calculating how much time do I have? How much do I trust them? How much have I already blabbed about this? Why don't I just get over it? That's all calculated in a, in a nanosecond. And then you say, oh, forget it. Just say fine and move on. There was a song by Jackson Brown about 20 years ago too that said, there was a line in the song that says, maybe people only ask you how you're doing because it lets on how little they could really care. The other half of the equation is also really a lie. I don't really want to know. Right? Right. What if, we, what if we really did? What if we did something with that? That word fine, you know, that word that uh, we get caught up on. What ha Let me give you an illustration of what it's like. It's like mom has made the most beautiful cake, getting ready to celebrate the birthday, and she's gone off to do the laundry, do some chores, and when she comes back, and walks into the kitchen, she sees the chair pushed up against the counter, and she notices the cake has a couple of little tiny handprints in it, right? And she sees a little trail of crumbs leading off into little Johnny's bedroom, right? And when she gets into little Johnny's bedroom, she sees him over in the corner with a sheepish little grin and chocolate. So much chocolate. So excited about the chocolate. 
Why? So she sees that. Hope that's still working. And she sees John and she says, Johnny, did you, did you see mommy's cake? He nods. Yeah. Did you touch mommy's cake? And he's got to imagine a big mouthful of cake, right? <laughs> no. And as silly as that may seem, and as much as we can kind of relate to that, we've probably all had our chances to be on both sides of that equation too. Imagine you've got a mouthful of your emotions or a mouthful of your troubles and a mouthful, and you're, you're trying your best to kind of keep that all contained. You're sheepishly saying, I'm fine. It's okay. I can like it. It's all right. That's how we go through life. But not Jesus. He was honest. He knew that he was about to get handed over to the Romans and he was going to get crucified. He had told him about it. He already knew it was coming. And it was tearing him apart inside long before they ever tried to tear his physical body apart on the outside. He's torn apart. But he was honest. And you know what? Not just with them. He was bluntly honest with God. He didn't hold it back from his father. Colossians 3, 9. Here's some verses, again, planting some verse seeds in your heart. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with all of its practices. You used to be that person, but you took all that off, and you're a new person now. So don't lie to each other. Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. And then, and then here's a really beautiful picture of the church. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there, and by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love. We, we, when we do that, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. And a key part of that growing and building is we are speaking the truth in love. We're honest with each other. It's a picture of the church. When the going gets tough, the blessed friends of Jesus get their friends and they get honest. And now for number three, those blessed friends of Jesus, we get down. When the going gets tough, the blessed friends of Jesus get down in a posture of prayer, not get down like boogie nights. I know some of you thought that. I know you did. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Jesus prayed, Father, isn't there some other way to accomplish this? So there must be. He described himself as being both sorrowful and troubled. The Greek word for troubled here means to be in very great distress. And there are three different words in the Greek that are used to describe distress. This is the strongest one. It's the strongest one. It really means deep depression. God, this is Jesus saying to his father, I am in the deepest of deep depressions over this thing that's about to happen. This is no small thing that he's talking about here. You know, in Hebrew... There's, there's often not words that separate. Now, I just was describing a Greek word, but in Hebrew, they don't have degrees of separation in words. They don't have good, better, and best. If they wanted to describe best or something excellent, they would say, it's good, 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 good. Right? They just keep going with the goods until you get the point. Usually it's in groups of three. In Isaiah 6, the angels are worshiping God, and they say, holy, holy, holy. See, because it's actually possible for us to be holy, but not holy, holy. Holy, that's God. All right, does that make sense? So in Hebrew, that's the way they thought. That's the way they spoke. 
When something's done three times, it's extreme emphasis. The repeating of the words and statements and even actions, it carried over into the way they thought and wrote in the New Testament. These were Hebrews. These were the Jews, right? So even though we read it in Greek, that's not what they spoke in. They were still thinking. Their culture and language was still wrapped into that same concept of how do we give emphasis to things. So let's look at verses 39, 42, and 44 in our scriptures today. Jesus prays three times to his father, and it shows just how important prayer is when the going gets tough, right? Three times he gets down and he prays. It wasn't just go have a prayer, okay, we're done with, see you later. It wasn't, you know, God, I got a meeting, or the Uber car is going to be here with dinner any second, and I got to get this prayer over with. So okay. he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. He continued to lean into this situation. You see, getting with God and being completely honest with him is of the utmost importance. Getting with God and being completely honest with him is of the utmost importance. And I know in my own experience, sometimes my first prayer, I'm not completely there. Sometimes when I come back to that, sometimes in the middle of that when I realize I'm not actually altogether honest with you, God, and let me give you everything I got about this, including maybe I'm upset with him. Maybe, maybe I did something and I haven't quite confessed it even to myself yet. It takes time. But being with God and being completely honest with him is of the utmost importance. You see, in this world, we're faced actually with two kinds of troubles commonly, right? I put that note on there for you. Two kinds of troubles. The first kind is instant troubles, emergency troubles, right? We don't usually see them coming. Sometimes even if we do see them coming, it came on quicker than we thought. We weren't quite ready. Instant troubles. And the other kind is gradual troubles. Things that have been kind of growing and building and they're kind of going on and, and but you know, maybe that'll be, maybe it'll just work itself out. Maybe it'll just be fine. I, I'll just be honest with you and tell you, I've been noticing a little bit of tendonitis in my elbow. I have never, ever experienced this before in my entire life. I'm 64 and three-fourths years old. And now when I take my coffee cup and go like this, the weight on there hurts. But I haven't told my wife about it till just now. <laughs> I've been, not, I didn't hold it for a sermon illustration either, believe me. I just decided to confess that. I sometimes, I've been praying about it, but it's like sometimes you've got to let it all out. You've got to be honest with things that are going on. Sometimes those gradual troubles and we don't do something about it. Now don't take me wrong. The instant stuff, which we're really good at, hey, this happened. We're good at rallying the troops and getting together, and, and we should be. It's a really positive, important thing to do. But this thing that, that Jesus is under is not just that emergency. We, once we get through this, we'll have dinner tomorrow, right? The storm on the Sea of Galilee was more of an instant thing, and I can take care of that for you guys. I can speak a word. He's into something that's going to be long-lasting, and it's been a long time coming. This thing's been building to this moment. This pivotal moment in history of his crucifixion has been building. And the effects of it, him actually carrying it out, is going to last forever. So this is in the gradual category, what he's got going on right there, okay? Um, a brief story, just to illustrate this, about another guy from the Bible who had a little thing going on and didn't, didn't go to God with it. Second Chronicles 16, verses 11 to 13. Short story. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then, in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. We got it. It's, all, it's just a little foot thing. It's all good. Two years later, he died. We've heard it many times said to us that we should approach God, that we should be with God. We've welcomed his spirit today. We sang that worship chorus and Terry prayed and we welcomed God's spirit. I felt it. I don't know if you did. I felt it. I felt the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, I'm here. We know we're supposed to be quick to approach God, but I think sometimes we're timid. Especially when the going gets tough. 
most especially because there's all these gradual things in our lives and we're not necessarily bringing them to God. Well, let me give you four ways about approaching God, four things that are important. And I'll be quick with this and then we'll move on to the last part. The first thing is approach God with confidence. Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So approach God with confidence. Secondly, approach God with faith. Hebrews 11.6, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him and must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Third thing, approach God with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me. And when you seek me, when, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That's when you'll find me. So we have confidence, faith, all of your heart. And lastly, with Jesus as Lord. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Approach God confidently, faithfully, full of heart, are completely set on finding him, and with the knowledge that our Lord Jesus has gone before us, he stands at God's right hand, interceding on our behalf. Today, right now, this moment, whatever you're going through, he's already saying, see mine? Do you see my child? Do you see my, do you see God? Do you see? They need you. Here he comes. Here is prayers. Here is prayers. That's why we always say in Jesus' name, but Jesus already paved the way. Hear his prayers. Hear her prayers, Lord. Here they come. They need you. Be confident of that and approach him and don't hold back. Don't wait two years. When life squeezes us and the pressure is on, we need to be like Jesus. When the going gets tough, those of us who are the blessed friends of Jesus, we need to get our friends, really good friends, the friends that have our back. We need to get honest. We need to get down in prayer, which will get us with God. And then lastly, we need to get obedient. This is the last thing that Jesus did in the garden. Looking again at verses 39, 42, and 44, the second half of each one of those verses says, your will be done. The second half of each one says, your will be done. It's an active statement, by the way. Jesus didn't say, you know, God, okay, this is a hard plan. I don't know if it'll work. You go ahead. Do it if you have to. Okay, go ahead. He didn't say that. He says, Father, I'm going to do your will. I am going to go do what you want done. When we pray, uh, don't take my comment as criticism. I think that uh, when we pray for each other to be safe and healthy, that's good. We don't want calamity to befall us. And the Psalms are filled with that. God, keep me safe from calamity. I want you to add to your prayers, make us strong and courageous. Make us confident of God with us so that as you're keeping me from calamity, now I'm able to go out in victory because being kept from calamity could be kept away from the battle. And we're meant to be in it, right? So add that to your prayers. God, I'll do your will. It's dangerous. It's hard. I'm at risk. Keep me from calamity. Keep me strong and courageous. I want to do both, Lord. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the hardest thing ever, ever. But he's not saying, God, go ahead, do what you got to do. He's saying, I will do what you have willed for me to do. Those of us who are parents have gone through this scenario. When a child continues to ask why they can or cannot do or have a certain something. And I was a child. I went through it too, but I was on the other side of the equation. First, I try to reason with my kids, spell it all out logically, explain why I don't have the money to pay for that. Then I give examples from my own life, you know, show them the scars, uh, you know, or other children. You know, I've raised other children. I know what I'm talking about. 
Sometimes I patiently listen and I hear all about how all the rest of the friends have it, do it, eat it, wear it, say it, all that, right? Read it, watch it. I listen, try to listen patiently. I might even occasionally bring up a YouTube video to show the ramifications of, uh, of um, jumping off bridges, for example, right? That was my dad's thing, you know, jump off the bridge. Maybe eating Tide Pods, so there, there's some negative consequences of that, or simply walking into a pole because your head's down and you're texting and you don't watch where you're going, right? Eventually, I usually get around to, well, is it right or wrong? And because I said so. <laughs> it's all too familiar for all of us in this room. We've all gotten to the because I said so's. And here's Jesus with his father saying, you've said so. See, that's not a bad answer. You've said so. So I'm going to do it. He was asking him for any other alternative. None of the other kids are being asked to go get crucified. God, why are you asking me? I'll be the only kid in my class crucified before school. And this was going to be a fun Easter break, too. I don't know. I'm sorry to make light of this. Jesus knew when the going gets tough that he needed to be obedient to his father. God loves obedience more than sacrifice. You know, Jesus did not get what he wanted. He didn't get what he wanted. Jesus got what was best. He got the best thing, not what he wanted. Hebrews 5.8 says, Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he had suffered. I'm almost done, but let me ask the worship team to come back and kind of reform up here and we'll get ready for our conclusion. And even, in, even as they're doing that, let me back up a bit and just talk to you a little bit about the two kinds of troubles. Just want to uh, speak to you a little bit about that. I think most of us are more comfortable letting other people know our needs than we are letting God know our needs. I think somehow there's an embarrassment that comes over us that, that somehow I should be still trying to perform well enough for God to accept me. I think that still gets ingrained in some of us. Um, and so sometimes we will let other people know, but, but we don't in our own prayer time. I, I just think there's people that will come and say, pray for me, but I don't know that they've necessarily already prayed for themselves. And Jesus is showing us an individual time of prayer. Um, around church, we get in the cards and stuff, we get so many more cards written for prayers for the things that we talk about here out loud. Physical well-being, comfort and, and encouragement in times of loss and grieving, safety during travel, provision in jobs and finances. We, we get all those, and I want to keep getting all those. Trust me, I do. But you know, in the garden, Jesus was really praying about relationships. He wasn't one time praying about heal the cripples, he did that in Luke 10. He sent them out and he said, go heal people and tell them about the nearness of, God, of the kingdom of God. Here now he's saying, God, all of those that you sent me to redeem, is this still the plan for how it's going to happen? All of those whom you love, who I also love, who you gave me, and I want to bring as many as I can to you, is this, it's all about the relationships. This gradual stuff, a lot of times, is the broken relationships. It's not really as simple as Asa had bad feet and didn't get it cured. A lot of times it's something happened between us that we didn't overcome that conflict. Something was said or not said, done or not done. Somebody was hurt in some way and we didn't fix it. And Jesus came to mend every relationship, especially our relationship with God. That's especially why he came. So consider very carefully that our eternal relationship with God is precisely why Jesus came to earth. All the other things that we pray about are wonderful and good and right and we should continue. But our relationship with God is why Jesus came. Our eternal relationship is God, with God is why he came and lived and taught and performed miracles. Our relationship with God is why Jesus was always fully submitted to his father's authority. If even one time 
he would have not been fully submitted to his father's authority, we would have reason to question whether God really loved us or not, or whether Jesus really stood for us or not. But he was completely faithful every single time. And that, my friends, the blessed friends of Jesus, that is the gospel. That is the good news. He was completely faithful to the mission he went on. He was completely submitted to God's authority so that in the end, our relationships with God will be perfect. And now our mission is to take that very same cause to the world. Do you get it? That's why we're here. That's why God, he called us. And as a church, when we do our parts, building each other up, growing in maturity, we go out and the world hears about this great love. That is the gospel. Don't just stand with me. We're gonna, I'm gonna give you last instructions and, and we're gonna have a worship song together and then we'll close in a prayer. I guess my homework for you for this week is to take those three names or one or two, you need to contact that person. The preference would be if you could be face to face in person so that all of the communication skills will be present. Your, your body language, your facial expressions, everything. If that's not possible, do it on a phone call. Let your voice be heard. Let's find a way to communicate with your three people. How much you trust them, you love them, you care about them, you're counting on them. And if it's true, how much they can count on you because that's often what happens. I, the three that I have listed in my, on my list, we feel mutual and we've talked about it. There, there's no surprise. And so it was no surprise a few months or a month or so ago when I got a phone call, we got legal troubles. Oh my, this is a person I would never have expected to have any legal troubles. He was being falsely accused. So we got to prayer right away. That was the first person he called after his wife. She's on his list too. But you see what I'm saying? And any time, night or day, he knows he can call me and vice versa. And that's how you should be. So that's your homework for this week. Don't put it off till next week. I'm going to make a list and I'm going to check it twice. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.